And Kathy, we are live. And I'd like to uh, reach out to our community. Thank you for joining us. Uh, on the call with us is Kathy Wilkins. She is CBT Nuggets HR Manager. She's going to go over a few things to help us get our resumes past HR and into the pile that says this person is going to be interviewed as opposed to the pile that says this person is going to get a callback eventually. So if you've ever wanted to know how to get past HR, let's ask HR. Kathy, go ahead and take it away. So good morning. I am Kathy Wilkins. I am the HR manager at CBT Nuggets. Um, and so we are going to go over the stuff that Jack talked about. I do want to um, let you know kind of up front, I will give some advice and some instruction, but there is a piece of HR that is a art form. And so as I walk through this, I want you all to keep that in mind because it does make a difference. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a... Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through sort of some of the questions that Jack already presented to me and talk about what that looks like. So when we talk about essential job requirements, those are the things that are going to be in the required portion when you see a job posting and then there's going to be preferred skills. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Bilingual is probably one of those examples, like it can be required or it can be preferred. Um, and so then what's going to happen is we're going to move through and determine where to post the position. Um, and then the position is posted and it goes live. So this is really where HR works with that hiring manager and it's before the job ever gets posted to kind of determine, okay, what's the baseline and who makes it through the screening process and who does not. And I kind of say, well, mostly. And part of that has to do with being sure that um, there's always a piece of art to the HR process. So, all right, Jack, you want to move to that next slide? Certainly. Certainly. So now what? That's always the question, right? Now what? I found this job. I think I'm qualified for it. I really want to apply. So there's a couple of things that I think as HR folks that can be frustrating when we're screening applicants. Um, and that is, we want you to do your research. And that has to do with, there's a couple of reasons. We want to be sure it's a company you really want to work for. So what that means is when you like do this application process, you want to make sure that this is a company you want to work for. The second thing is you want to at least be sure you understand what their business is. Um, and part of that is, is that comes to being able to kind of cater or tweak your resume so it actually sort of fits some of those things. And so after you've kind of done a bit of that research, what you want to do is review and reread the job posting now that your research is done. And I can give you a couple of tips for that. So one of the things that you can do is you can always obviously Google the, the company. Sometimes it's beneficial to go to like that Google page two or three because typically what's going to happen to the search engine page two or three because sometimes you can get information that you're not going to get on the um, actual um, company's web page. So just go do a little digging. Um, and then the other thing is make sure you kind of understand what they do. And then also you can go to uh, go into LinkedIn and see who's working for them. If you have a LinkedIn account, go in and do a little research and plug in the company name and say, oh, okay, this guy works there, this guy works there, or this gal works here, and here's what they've done, and that sort of thing. Because that makes a big difference sort of in what you're going to do when you move forward for the presentation piece of it of you as a human on a piece of paper. So, okay, Jack, can you go to the last? Well, I, got, I think about two more slides. So this is one of the things that I think is a little difficult it's hard to swallow, I guess, is the best way to put it. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to assume that a single resume will fit every job. And, and, and sometimes I think as a person who's sitting in an HR chair, you can tell that. You can kind of tell that this person is not truly interested or maybe sort of qualifies but doesn't necessarily really qualify. And you have to go digging for it. And sometimes that takes up too much time to actually dig through it. So you might be qualified, but because the information we're looking for is buried someplace, I think that the average time that an HR professional actually looks at a resume is somewhere, first round is somewhere between 15 and 25 seconds, depending on how big that is. So those things are important. 
So, um, and then let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. So you want to build your base core competence, re competency resume, and you're going to include your work history. So one of the things that I think is, it is and continues to be confusing is what about job history? How do I present that? Is it chronological? Is it skills-based? Is it, how do I do that? And I think that that really truly depends on what your skill set is and sort of how you want to present. What I will say is do not present a skills resume without your work history. If you do that, you're not going to get anywhere because what happens is HR professionals want to know whether you've worked or not. So even if you're in a position where you're transitioning jobs, they still want to know, was this person working? Was this person not working? So I think it really depends on what you're most comfortable with. And HR people, some have a preference for one and some have a preference for other. Back to there's a little bit of HR that's art. So again, if you do a little bit of that research ahead of time, that might help you try and figure out which way you need to put that resume for that particular job. So, and then I think that one of the questions I think that most people come up against, and not that everybody has gaps in their employment, but I think that folks do, um, I would recommend that you are prepared with an answer for whatever that is. So, and that could be, hey, I went back to school, hey, I did this, hey, I had kids at home, whatever that is, but you want to be able to address that. And what I will say is typically, um, I don't want to say typically, I, and I don't know about other HR professionals, also have a tendency to look at what was happening in the economy if there are gaps in employment. So there are particular industries where there was a lack of employment just because of a recession in the United States. So you know that 2007, 2008, 2009, if somebody's got a gap in their employment at that, at that particular era, it's not always necessarily anything other than the economy was in the toilet. So I just want people to be aware of that. So, but be prepared for that. And typically if that gap is more than say 60 to 90 days, you're really gonna wanna be able to talk about what happened. Even if it is, hey, I decided to go back to school, whatever that was. Cassie, so, okay. real quick yeah. with a question. Okay, okay. Um, we, we have a question from the audience. Uh, how, do I tell, how do I tell you about me? is basically what the question is asking. And I think that's what you're going over right now. You're you're basically saying to make sure that um, whatever you're applying for, you're kind of it, not just throwing your resume out there like you're fishing and you're hoping to catch a job, um, but you're actually applying for something that you really want. Um, so how does that fit in with what we, what we talk about in terms of who we are um, outside of their, our skill set and our job history. Okay, so I'm going to address that here, and I think on the next slide. Okay. Jack, bear with me for just a second. If I don't, then we'll come back and revisit it. So let's talk a little bit about cover letters, and are they important or are they not important? And here's my, it varies from company to company. What I will say to you is if somebody asks for one, send it. Okay, so don't assume that just because you you sent your resume in and it's a great resume, but they actually asked you to send a cover letter and you don't do that, sometimes that's a stop no matter what, even if you're absolutely qualified for the position. So that's the piece, Jack, where you definitely have an opportunity to tell them about who you are. Ah, okay. So your cover letter is often, if it's requested, okay, mm -hmm. it's often the place where you get to say, hey, here's who I am. Hey, when you take a look at my resume, you may notice I have this gap in my whatever. Or, hey, by the way, I'm actually a great public speaker. Whatever that is, you're going to want to emphasize that in your cover letter. So then, hey, Jack, will you go to the next slide for me? Sure. Uh, can I ask you a little bit more about what you're, what you're saying there? Um, so most of the time when we look up uh, job tips and, and applying for jobs, all that kind of stuff, we hear, oh yeah, you really got to present yourself in the resume. You're saying to take that uh, a different direction and instead of telling about ourselves in the resume, keep the resume straight to the point, this is my job history, this is what I do, but talk about ourselves in a cover letter instead. Is, is not, not necessarily, Jack, so it's, it's twofold, okay? So what it is is if there's a cover letter requested, uh -huh. so if you read a job posting and there's a cover letter requested, you want to make sure that you include that and take that opportunity on your cover letter. Okay, because that's the place where you get to expand a little bit on what's on your resume. 
but you want to do it in both places. Again, it's about there isn't a cookie cutter approach because you can't. Just, okay. you, know, you can't just take a cookie cutter approach to trying to land the best job that you want. It just, for whatever reason, it's not, it's not typically successful unless you're really lucky. So did I answer that question? Um, well, yeah. Uh, what we're still trying to figure out is when and where and how uh, do we just talk about ourselves? Um, I, I think that's what you're going to get into in the next right, slide, right? Right, right, right. So, um, so part of this is what's the best thing to do to get past HR screening and make it to the top of the interview list, right? This is one of the, of the three questions Jack asked. It was the third question, but sort of, I think, the most important one. And what it is is I, make sure that your skills – Guy, I got some grammar errors. I apologize. Make sure you have the skills to do the job. And if you're not 100% qualified and don't meet the minimum requirements, be clear on what you do meet. And so that's where, when you're talking about who am I in your resume, things that you want to do is you want to be, and this will get exemplified a little bit, Jack, when we go over the resumes themselves. Okay. Um, but it's about be clear and, and be concise. So it's those two things. But how do you get them to, to know who you are? I think that all has to do with the presentation. And I don't really know how else to, to answer that question because HR professionals want to know two things. Do you have the minimum skills to do the job? And secondarily, are you going to fit? Those are always the two questions because even though we don't talk about are you going to fit, that's an important piece. So we can, Jack, I think that'll be better exemplified when we actually take a look at the resumes for me to be able to explain that. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is, is be aware. So it says, look for keyword matches. So if you have that skill and have not used there, as in the company you're applying to language, do your best to make it match. And so part of that is, is what happens with many applicant tracking systems. And if any of you guys have applied for jobs online, oftentimes it's not going to be, um, it's not like you're going to send a resume and a cover letter and not have more to do. But oftentimes what will happen is that resume will self-populate into the applicant tracking system. And sometimes the first reason you'll get bounced is because they're looking for a keyword match and you didn't have it somewhere in that document that you sent to them. I've seen great candidates get passed up because they missed the keyword search. So make sure that when you're doing that, you're taking a look at it because that matters. Um, and then what I would say is, and I think this is something that I look for, and I think lots of people do when you're, you know, my work history is I've worked here, I worked for an engineering firm, like mechanical side of things, we're an OEM manufacturer. So when you're dealing with people who are um, technical by nature, what you want is somewhere on that, on that resume to be able to determine can this guy have a conversation? Can this person have a conversation? So sometimes that's exemplified by what you're doing externally. And sometimes that has to be exemplified by maybe you were in a leadership role or you can talk about how you worked with teams and how that was successful. So I hope that helps a little bit. Any more questions, Jack? Uh, not yet. Uh, and I'm glad you said something. I'd like to reach out to the audience. If you do have any questions, go ahead and pop them up on the uh, right hand side of your screen uh, and as soon as we see them pop up we'll go ahead and uh, and uh, address them as, as we go along sorry Kathy go ahead no I and and that's just part of what we can do so Jack since I am having a screen sharing issue mm -hmm. can you can you pull up those jobs and the um, resumes that I was working on just a little bit for me sure give me just a moment here Sorry guys, this is impromptu, so give yeah. me a moment and we'll we'll get we'll get rolling here in just a moment. Uh, I'm almost done. Give me just a couple more seconds here. Okay, who do you want to start with, Kathy? Um, Josh or Bob? 
I, whatever one you choose, Jack, I'll be able to talk to. So if you can just pull them up. Sure. That would be fantastic. Okay, the first job that we're going to take a look at is the Network Security Engineer Level 4 uh, for the company Vencore. Um, again, this is a job posting that I found out on Indeed. I think I found it a few days ago, uh, possibly. Um, and the person applying for this is John Doe. He has foreign military experience. And let me know uh, how you want me to navigate through here, Kathy. I, let me ask a question first. Is that at all readable? I mean, can the audience actually see what's out there, Jack? Or can we increase the size? Uh, I could increase the size. Give me a second. I'm pretty sure it's readable, but we'll go ahead and do it just in case. So let me blow this up a little bit more. That's, that's pretty good, Jack. Um, and so I, um, I guess I took some liberties, but if you can scroll down for just a second, Jack. So okay. one of the things. Yeah, one of the things, Jack and I were talking a little bit earlier about most resume templates um, are in a, in a place where they, they kind of indicate to put your, your education and your experience or your, your uh, whatever, you like your certifications and that sort of stuff. They indicate that, they, that to put those at the bottom. And I would c contend, I guess, that it's much easier for an HR professional to see those things first. Because again, if we go back to those minimum requirements and what we want is somebody who's got certification in CCNA and what we want is somebody who maybe has two years of education on top of that and somebody with five years of experience, I'd rather know that they met those educational um, educational experience first because that makes a huge difference on, okay, am I going to take the time to scroll through the rest of that resume? So um, Jack, will you, so that's, that's what I did here with John, is I just kind of went, okay, John, let's take all of this and move it up on the top. And then the other thing that I did, again, with the, um, so if we talk about the foreign military experience, if you notice, I pushed some stuff together. Because um, uh, they were on, Jack, can you scroll down to the very bottom for me for just a second? So if you, and it's a little hard to read, but if you look at kind of the way the foreign military experience was, was put together, so there was a lot of courses involved that this particular person had taken. So the sergeant course, the flight sergeant, and there's, I, there's one more on there that I can't read. And what it is, I condensed those all together because basically what that proves to me is that there was an increase in the ranking in his military practice. So Jack, will you scroll back up to the top for me? And so, can you scroll back down just a little bit, Jack? Sorry, it's hard when I'm not driving. So there's a couple of things here. Again, one of those things is it's 19 years of military experience, but we don't know when those years of experience were. So as an HR professional, the first question I'm gonna ask is, okay, has he been out six months or has he been out 10 years? That's one of the questions that I'm gonna ask. And then if you move down to right there, that particular paragraph, Jack, and I'll just kind of speak to this for just a second and then we can, I can take some questions if you want. One of the things to remember on a resume is be clear, be concise, less is sometimes more. So anytime, and just so you know that when I write first passes, I'm, I have to go back and delete all the little extra words. It's just the way I write, sort of the way I talk to. So that piece of it is important to like have it scrubbed. Like in, sometimes that'll help if you have somebody that you really trust to take, take a look at that. So that's sort of what I did is I reduced that. And then, Jack, will you scroll down just a little bit further? Sure. Tell me when to stop. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. So the other thing is there's a comment. Scroll back up just a little bit, Jack. Uh, that, that works right there. Stop. So what it is is there's a comment somewhere, somewhere over here on the side. And what it is is most HR professionals don't need more than 10 years back of work history. And so not that it's not valid, but what I would do in this particular circumstance with this particular resume is I would condense that to the fact that you were employed. And I, I believe in this particular circumstance, I was trying to, and I don't know, but again, this is what I'm trying to fetter out as the HR professional. Did this person go right into the military after what I'll call primary education? So high school or that piece of it, or, and part of it is I'm not real familiar with how that works. 
but it would just be sort of, I would condense those things and put them into a place where they are um, condensed into, hey, I worked during this time frame when I was in high school or when I was doing my college work or whatever it was, rather than it being really long. Because what happens is, again, if you figure a resume lands on a desk from anywhere between 15 and 30 seconds, I'm gonna lose interest before I get through to what could potentially be the pertinent information. So, okay, so Jack, go ahead. So you're saying that all of this, uh, pretty much right here, okay. Right, and even maybe up a little further than that, I, I didn't, it's like, so there's a comment right here, Jack. Anyway, it's like, that piece of it, I would just condense. Okay. You know, and just because, again, and when you have your certifications and all of that stuff buried at the end of page four, mm -hmm. I'm not going to get that far. Most HR people won't. Now, that's a great point because a lot of times when we talk to, uh, well, recruiters will tell us, put everything on your resume, everything you've ever done. And, you know, because they've got to turn around. They're salespeople. They've got to turn around. they got to sell it to someone. Um, right. But from an HR perspective, you don't need to see all that. You need to see what's pertinent. I would, what I, would, I would say there's some truth to that. Now, what I will say to you is if there's something pertinent that occurred, do you know what I mean? So if, in other words, I'll give an example. If you were an IT professional 15 years ago and you went and did something else for 15 years and you came back, or 10 years, and you came back to IT, then there's some relevance to that. But what I would do is I would address that kind of and, and and explain the gap but just state that you have this history and you did this and you decided you loved it and you're coming back does that make sense yeah okay so okay let's go to the next one jack or do we have questions uh i don't see any questions yet okay. um we'll take a look at uh bob jones who is applying for the information assurance instructor So there's a lot of conversation about objectives, and here's my, and this is strictly the Kathy Wilkins opinion, not everybody else's. I will say that if they are not asking for a cover letter, I wouldn't necessarily use the word objective, but I would put a blurb in there before you start talking about your skills about who you are as a person and what you're good at and how to present that. I would put that, but I wouldn't necessarily use the objective piece. So, Jack, when the question came up about how do I tell them who I am, uh -huh. that's where I would put it. But I wouldn't necessarily call it an objective. So when you have a resume without a cover letter, that first paragraph should be, hey, this is who I am. So, and find the right words, words to grab people. And that's your opportunity to tell people also kind of where you're, where you're, people skills exist, or for me in my role, it might be the fact that, you know what, I can do budgets. Let me tell you about the fact that I can do budgets even though I'm an HR professional. So it's that same idea about how do you, that's where you have the opportunity to present yourself. But if you use, the, if you use objective, sometimes what happens is they're looking not at who you are, but at what you're trying to, trying to accomplish, I guess is the word I would use. And so I think that it's important that you talk in this little blurb about who are you, especially if you don't have a cover letter opportunity. Okay. So, um, and that's because then what's going to happen, you're going to say, hey, here's who I am. Now, let me tell you what I can do. And then let me tell you what my skills are, what my certifications and education are. So it's like, here's who I am. Here's what my certifications are. Here's what my education is. Here's what my work history is. And somewhere, like this has a skills profile, you can kind of decide where that where you want to put that. So like my personal resume is set up with my little blurb about, hey, this is who I am as a human. The next thing is sort of my skills profile, very similar to this. Uh -huh. And at the bottom of where my skills profile is, I talk about, I have an SPHR certification, I have a bachelor's degree and blah, blah, blah. And then I also state I have a couple of other leadership roles that I'm in that are associated with nonprofits. So in that first glance, anybody looking at my resume goes, she's got the education I'm looking for, she's got the certification I'm looking for, oh, she, I want her to have budget experience. And then what will happen is I'll, then I'll scroll down to the next thing and go, okay, this guy's telling me he's got this stuff. Where did he get it? 
Ah, okay. So right here in this objective, uh, how should we phrase this this blurb? How long should it be? Because you know, we we get we get conflicting uh, we get conflicting advice. Basically, um, you look at a template, and you know, we're told, "Hey, you got to throw in all these action words. You got to make sure that you drive the point home." I get what you're saying, Kathy. Um, if there's no cover letter, then ob objective type blurb is appropriate. Right. So well, I and what I would say is you want to be, and I can't, I can't speak to this for anybody else, Jack, but if you know who you are, do you know what I mean? This is where you want to present it. And you do, action words matter, but again, it has to do with the research for the company that you've done, right? That's where you can't just assume my, my objective and my, my blurb about who I am is, is going to match every job I'm applying for. This is the place where you can tweak that. Okay, so, so, so if, you're, if you're in a position where, you know, they want you to be able to interface with everybody internally, mm -hmm. and you've got great networking skills and you're going to be that guy at the help desk, what you want to do in this particular blurb is quickly tell them why you're good with people and where that occurred. Okay, so going with the, uh, the standard gen generic uh, to find a great job working for your organization because I really want the job type of objective statement is not what you're saying to do. What you're saying to do is to get in there and say, hey, I'm going to be great for your company uh, or I would be good for your company because I am good uh, socially. I, I have the ability to help people figure things out. Um, I do this on a, on a constant basis. Is, is that kind of what I should be taking from this? Right, and that's kind of the right idea. And we had a question over here that I think that it's it's a legitimate question. It says, "What should the objective be called if it's the intro paragraph?" And and my response to that is, it doesn't have to be anything. So oh, you can oh. just put the you don't need to put the objective necessarily in there. So it would be Bob Jones, Toronto, Canada, and then just this little blurb about, "Hey, here's who I am." Do you know what I mean? So this that could be completely deleted off of there, and just have it be, "Hey." I'm da -da 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 -da, whatever that is. Do you see what I'm saying? However you want to present, depending on the job you're applying for. Again, what you want to do is kind of have those key words that you know are going to be in there. Uh -huh. You know, because oftentimes, as an HR professional, I don't even read the objective, Jack, because it's going to say exactly what you said. Hey, I want a really cool job with a really cool company. Well, great, thanks. You know what I mean? I'd rather you said, hey, you know what? I trained at CBT Nuggets for this many hours, and I think I'm going to be a great fit because I've already got the certification through your training program. Awesome. awesome. That, that's the sort of stuff that's going to catch my attention, especially if there's not a cover letter. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, do we want to move on to the next uh, resume or back to the slides? Yep. yep. No, we can, we can move back on to that other one. We're still here on Bob Jones or the next person? I think, scroll down for me for just a second. So the interest, yeah, this one's important. Scroll down to the bottom for me, Jack. Ah. So again, this is somebody who had a whole bunch of prior work history in there, like way back, that I wouldn't necessarily include. Um, so scroll back down, except he actually had prior experience sort of in the networking environment. Mm -hmm. But what but what I would do is kind of put a, rather than it being specific to job to job, what I would do is put that in there for that time frame about I have IT experience or a desk support or whatever this is, but not have it be that long. And then talk about, because this particular person I think went into business for themselves after that. Uh -huh. And so that that makes a difference because what happens is it appears to me that this person wants to get back into the IT profession. Okay, so uh, while we're talking about that, let me let me jump in. Uh, I'm just going to move things around. I hope I don't confuse anything. So how would you... So let's go. If you go down to the bottom for me, Jack. Okay. Uh, I, I, no, go yeah, ahead. I have a question about that. Okay, so... You were saying you wouldn't necessarily um, explain it item by item, the, the way that it is here. Uh, so would it be appropriate to do something like 1997 through 2004, 
uh, worked in IT, sorry about that, uh, capacity for various companies. Right. Like that. Right, or the thing to do in this particular situation, Jack, which might, which might actually, I'm, I'm talking off the cuff here, but so we talked about a, um, a skills resume versus a chronological resume, uh -huh. and this would be one of those resumes actually that I would hybrid, believe it or not. So what I would do is I would put that up there. I would put the skills, especially if there's some that are mashed together, if that makes sense. So you did sort of similar things at all of those businesses. I would put skills learned, do you see what I'm saying? And then after that, I would put the job history. Am I making sense? Yes. So that's, so that, in other words, so that it's not whatever that is, three, four paragraphs long, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's concise and it's maybe down to half a page where you can actually bullet point, hey, here's what I was doing in this time frame, and at the very bottom put that work history, where you would put local IT service provider 2001 to 2000, do you see what I'm saying? Put those, like put just that very top line there, Jack, uh -huh. do you see what I'm saying? where it says innovations or whatever that is, local IT services provider, I would list those at the bottom and then try and condense those skills that I'd acquired. Ah, okay. So you're gonna take all of this and just condense it into, one tiny section maybe or smaller section and then after so i would put it prior whatever it services i don't have the right language jack and then what i would do is after that i would put that work history below okay so i think th this person is currently doing social media work or something uh-huh so what i would do is put relevant it experience do you see what I'm saying? Put relevant IT experience, rattle off what those things are and why they matter. And then what I would do is put the work, just the work history for that 10 year period down below that. Okay, great. Um, one of the members of our audience, uh, Kyle, he posted a question. Kyle, could you repost that question? There we go, perfect. Uh, here's, a, here's a question for you, Kathy. You should see it on your screen now? Maybe. Ah, uh, let me, let me, hold on, Jack. Guy, I hope I don't lose you guys again. Okay. If you're not seeing it, don't worry, I can read it off to you. Okay, no, I'm not seeing it, Jack. Okay, so, um, Kyle is asking, he, he, he says that he has typically always included a cover letter, whether it's asked for or not. Should we not include cover letters um, by default, or should we just be specific? If we're asked for it, then we provide it. If not, if we're not asked for it, we just don't even bother with it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like a lawyer for half a second, <laughs> and I'm gonna say it depends. And I'd love to say I had some clear, concise answer on that. I would, I would say if it's asked for, always provide it. I think that if it's not necessarily asked for, I would make your resume a tad bit longer, to be honest with you, and address it in that first paragraph. Okay. But again, there's a piece of it that's an art form. I know there are some HR professionals that if they do not ask for a cover letter, they won't even look at it. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what we want to avoid um, since, the, since we're, we're basically blind you know, when we're applying for jobs. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, the best we have to go off of is advice from, you know, recruiting websites, uh, job sites, you know, uh, monster.com, things like that. And they're all telling us, yes, get your, get your uh, cover letter and customize it for everybody. So what that means to us is we get this one canned cover letter and one canned resume and we change a few words in it and then we send it off and then we find another job posting and we do the same thing um, so for us it's kind of it's, it's extremely confusing for job seekers because well, you know we want to put our best foot forward and Kyle kind of hit it on the nose he's gonna send out that cover letter whether they ask for it or not so what is better to send it and ha to just send it and see what happens I mean if you don't ask for a cover letter and you get one is that going to uh, is that going to reflect badly on us, 
you're going to get the cover letter on top of the resume and you're going to say, well, I didn't ask, one, ask for one, so I'm not even going to read this person's resume. Is that going to happen? There's always that potential. And, and I, I mean, I just, just the most honest answer I can give you. A lot of, that's kind of where the art form of HR comes in. Um, if you make it through that initial screening process, just try and remember there's still another human sitting on the other end of that process who's making decisions. Mm -hmm. And some people, some HR professionals, and part of it has to depends on what their current workload is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what they're looking at. Does that make sense? So it could be, and sometimes if you send it and they're like, oh, you didn't follow instructions, I'm not going to do it anyway. I, th that's just enough right there. You didn't follow the instructions that I gave. I'm um, done. So again, it just kind of depends on who's on the other side of that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So like you were saying, if they ask for a cover, cover letter, we send it. If they don't specifically ask for it, don't send it, but make your, make your, um, this is about me blurb, make that a little bit longer. Yeah. It, do the takeaway okay great Brandon also threw out a question um, he wants to he wants to be clear on what he's hearing um, he's saying do the skills need to be listed below the companies um, in short form right so what I would do is I would list the skills out like that were acquired during that time frame kind of and, and like I said condense what you can and then what I would do is put the work history underneath that so, hey, here's my IT skills. I left for a while. I want to come back, so to speak. This is what you're saying. And so you're going to put that in there. Here's what my IT stuff is. Here's what I've done. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I would put the companies you worked for. So, but if you scroll down a little bit further on this resume for me. Mm -hmm. Keep going. So if you go to the self-taught piece of it, scroll down for me just a little bit further, Jack. Right there. So this piece right here. So it looks like this person has current, the current comp, and I don't know whether they're certified or not, so this is something I don't know. But what I would also do is take this piece and add it up there when you're talking about your IT experience. So you're and saying move this? this? Person looks like they're trying to transition back in after being out for a while. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I think if those certifications are there, that needs to be noted. Mm -hmm. If they're not completed, but there's a testing window that you're planning on doing that in, I would add that. So current study, Comp TIA security, scheduled to test in June of 2016. Oh. Okay. Whatever that is. You see what I'm saying? Because if you haven't completed it, but you're clearly stating that your intention is to finish, uh -huh. that can make a difference. Gotcha. Okay, so it's not enough to just say, yeah, I've got the book and I've got the CBT Nuggets subscription. You got to take it a step further and say, yeah, I'm studying and here is my test date. I'm so nervous, but I'm going to go for it. Right. Okay. Because, what that, because what that indicates is, is because the person is transitioning back into IT, what I would say is that gives clear indication to me that the person is self-motivated, wants to be part of back in the IT world, and then what they're saying to me is, okay, and this is the data I've committed to taking the test. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we've got another question real quick, uh, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. uh, from PJ in the community. And basically he wants to know, uh, well, well let, me, let me kind of paraphrase what he's saying. Uh, mm -hmm. He's... He's asking, how, do, how does HR know if someone is um, actually right for, the, for a technical job when you don't really necessarily know what all the acronyms are? How are you going to get past that hurdle? Right. So it comes back to kind of what we talked about earlier on, Jack. Mm -hmm. So, and I can, I can speak to that. But when you go and you go meet with that hiring manager and we talk about keyword search matches, Mm -hmm. As an HR professional, I'm going to have that job posting that I worked on with the manager that uh -huh. clearly says, I need a CCNA, I need somebody with CompTIA, whatever it is. Uh -huh. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm going to take the, the manager's lead 
on what those acronyms are that they are looking for. And I'm in a match. So when we talked about keyword searches, mm -hmm. that's part of what I'm talking about. Okay. Does that make sense? So yeah. I don't necessarily know. And most HR professionals don't necessarily know. Okay. But what's going to happen is you're going to work with that hiring manager who's going to say, this is what I want this person to have. Here's the acronyms. Here's the full name. If they have either of those two things, please make sure that they also have the three years of experience that I'm looking for. And then will you please push them off to me? Gotcha. Okay. So that's why you're saying it's really important that we, that we get in there and um, kind of customize our resume to fit what is, what's on the job posting. So that's why you're saying those keywords are so important because that's what you as the HR person are focused on is those keywords. Right. Gotcha. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we've got one more in here. I'm going to put it up there. Uh, are you able to see those questions yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and do we want to move on to the next resume or did you still want to talk about uh, Bob Jones? No, no, we can move on to the next one. Okay. Um, okay, so speaking of acronyms, so let, let's talk about this resume really quick. Mm -hmm. um, and um, scroll back up for me, will you, Jack, just a little bit? And actually, you know, Jack, I'm not real sure why I pulled this out. Maybe because I was working on this last minute. So actually, this resume I probably should not have deleted. So, Jack, will you undelete that for me? This part here? Yeah, can you just reject that? Yeah. There should be a little reject. There is. I got to. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> Makes the uh, text a little bit bigger. Okay. No, no, this is actually. This is actually. I'm getting nasty feedback. I'm getting nasty feedback. That is actually. That is actually. Breakdown of what I would. Breakdown of what I would. About, hey, here's who I am. Uh -huh. And that makes a huge difference. But what I did do again is I moved that his certification and that sort of stuff up on what it is. So it's like, here's who I am. Here's what I know. Here's what I'm continuing to do. And then pretty much below that, Jack, is the summary of qualifications. Gotcha. I see what you did there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Is there anything else that you wanted to go over on this resume? No, no, I think you're going to share these, aren't you, Jack? Yes, I am. And for the audience, James Hodge uh, is applying for the Senior Network Administrator, uh, which was this job posting here. And I'll, I'll provide everyone with, a, uh, with links to these job postings and to the uh, resumes with all the comments on them. Uh, after the uh, webinar is over, I'll make sure everyone in the community has access to it. Um, so what other things could James do to, uh, to kind of liven this up? Um, I, we see that he does, he did the same thing that Bob did in his resume where he's listing a whole bunch of prior experience because he, he obviously he's thinking, okay, I've got to go back to my very beginning in IT and say everything I've done. And as you look at his resume, you realize he has kind of bounced out of IT and then come back. Right. Um, so how crucial, what are, what are the, uh, what are the key things that someone like that has to do? I mean, we, we went over it a little bit with Bob, um, mm -hmm. but it looks like Bob was kind of starting out in IT and then he left IT for quite some time and now he's coming back to IT whereas James is slightly different where he's primarily IT once in a while when the economy gets slower he gets bored with his job he goes and does something else for a little bit and then he comes back to IT um, so do we treat these two candidates the same uh, do we treat their resumes the same well I think which two Jack uh, James and Bob. So go back to Bob for just a second. You want me to go all the way top? Well, well, and this is where, no, go, go all the way to the bottom for me, Jack. So the difference here, Jack, is first off, just as, as making the, the paper, making it or not making it. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? 
James Hodges, because he meets that minimum requirement of having a CCNA, uh -huh. and I don't know whether Bob did or not, or does or not. Oh, okay, so it looks like James has more of the qualifications. He's He looks like more of a fit at first glance. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. Um, let me read off the question. Uh, from Arthur, he has been out of corporate IT for nine years, working for himself, fixing computers. Uh, looks like a side business. Mm -hmm. um, before that, he worked for a financial services company as help desk. Now he's coming back to corporate IT. Um, how should he? What, what he's what his exact words are? What advice uh, do we have for him after he completes his MCSA? Uh, I guess that means uh, what I would assume is how is he going to blow that up and make that the centerpiece of his uh, of his resume? So I think it comes back to what we were talking about, Jack. I would, again, the resume we were talking about where put that, put the, hey, here, here's what my skill set is. Hey, here's where I was doing it. When we talk about the difference between a chronological and a skills resume, uh -huh. and if you guys don't know what those two are, Jack, I'll see if I can get you a couple of links to what the difference is. So in yeah. this particular situation with Arthur, I would move towards a skill-based resume because he was in IT, stayed sort of dealing with the computer piece of the world, and now he's got a certification. Right? That's, am I understanding that correctly? Uh-huh. Okay. And so what I would do is do that skill-based resume where he could basically have that, um, his certification be his premier as he's going through, like have it be the first thing that people see. And then talk about how he got there and then talk about, you know, what he did for the interim. Because obviously skills were acquired even though he wasn't in the corporate IT world. I'm assuming. That's an assumption on my part. Okay. But I can get you some links to what those look like. Okay, no problem. So, um, it, it, so when we when we first get our certificate, and you know, we're going like, uh, let's let me rephrase that. So, I just completed Microsoft Certified Systems uh, Administrator, mm -hmm. um, and that's a really big deal. And now I'm applying for this job that wants an MCSA uh, with minimal experience. Um, you're saying to point them directly to that, you want, you want me to put that certificate right up at the top of my resume where they're gonna see it right there as soon as they look. So Jack, let's look at James Hodges on the screen right now, right? Yeah. Because this, this person is also kind of bounced back and forth. Mm -hmm. But the job description clearly states they want somebody with a CCNA, right? And the thing about the, and, and if you notice, what I did, Jack, is I actually moved that CCNA portion of it to the front because in the original part of, right, so what I'm doing is, again, this is education and experience. They want this. Mm -hmm. right, so there it is. So I don't have to go far to look for it. And again, if you're talking about those keyword searches, no matter what happens with this person's resume who has the MCSA, they're not automatically going to go into the no thank you pile. Because at a minimum, they meet a certification requirement. So then I'm going to pop and go, okay, they meet the minimum certification requirements. What else has this person done? So oftentimes, because okay. again, when somebody asks the question about acronyms and the HR person, how do they know, right? First glance is going to be, okay, this guy has this. Again, remember, 15 to 30 seconds. 15 to 30 huh. seconds is the best. Okay? So if what it is is I see that instantaneously, I'm going to be like, okay, this guy's going to go in this pile that I'm at least going to look at again. It doesn't go into the automatic no pile. Uh -huh. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go through and see, okay, what else does this person have? Do you see what I'm saying? So then there's a second pass. So again, the first pass is 15 to 30 seconds. Sometimes the second pass is going to be more like two to five minutes because you're actually going to pause and see whether or not they meet the rest of that criteria. Gotcha. Okay. So when when we get the advice to customize our resume, um, you're you're saying not just change a couple of words. You're saying customize the resume to fit whatever the job posting is is asking for. Right. So what because it, 
to move things around the way the, the way that you're talking about um you're, you're saying that this is totally appropriate because to us you know all the advice that we've been given says yeah you, you just get the canned one and then you, you change the company name and you change a few words and you know you can send that out just like you do all the time and obviously that's not the way way it should go because many of us can tell you that that's not the way it should go so but what you're saying is go ahead and your section okay yeah can i ask a question jack yes ma'am part of the reason for this is have many people had success with that uh me personally yeah here's my canned resume oh i changed this word and i changed that word and what's the success rate been for that yeah, uh, personally speaking, it's probably one in a hundred. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't work, and I've never been told to do it any different than that. And so as a piece of advice, right, if you took those hundred pieces of paper and threw them out there looking for a job, or you decided there was 20 jobs that you really wanted to apply for, and you took that other 80 that you sent and took the time to tweak that resume to fit that actual job, you're probably going to have a higher hit rate, at least at first conversation. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because uh, and and what I keep alluding to is, um, as a job seeker, I feel that there is so much disinformation out there. It's hard to find good information, and and I want to thank you because I think you've given us a ton of good information. Um, so. What I wanted to share with, what I want the uh, audience to take away from this is, okay, take uh, me personally, and I, I'm sure that there's going to be at least a handful of people out there who will say the same thing. Um, I'll get that resume, I'll, I'll take it over to a resume specialist, you know, um, I'll refine it, refine it, refine it until I get that one resume that just looks absolutely outstanding. It's the best that I could come up with. Um, and I'll just keep changing those little words. And I know many, many people, especially in IT, we do that because we don't want to re-explain CCNA or CCENT or CompTIA. We don't want to re-explain any of that. We're, we're, we're kind of conditioned to think that once we have that great outstanding resume, um, you just need to change a few words. You're saying don't do that. Uh, you want... I there, guess we should be what I would think back is it depends a little bit on there is that possibility uh -huh. just say but I'm also saying do your best to make your if you have the skill set okay don't like inflate your if you have the skill set do your best to present it in a manner that matches the job description even if you're thinking the person who posted this job had no idea what they were talking about because that sometimes happens right it's like so what I'm saying is so there may be occasions where that stellar resume is going to work. Uh -huh. But I would also say, take a look at what that job posting is, what that mm -hmm. company is looking for, find out who they are, find out what the language of that company is, and then go back and look at your resume and say, okay, it's really important. Everything I read on this company, they use we. Uh -huh. Maybe I need to pay attention to that. So part of that is then you take a minute and then you go, okay, what does this look like to somebody who might be reading it for the very first time? So that's like I said, Jack, I went, when this example where it's the CCNA that you're talking about is required, I want to know that. That's Especially if you figure I only want to spend, again, 15, five, whatever, up to 30 seconds the first pass of their resume. I already know he has something that we have that is required. That piece matters, but I okay. think it's important. Yeah, so it's back to there's a little bit of art form to HR. I, you know, it's not always cut and dry. Great. Um, okay, Kathy, uh, we're pushing an hour here. Do you want to? Are we ready to go ahead and wrap up, or is there yeah, anything yeah. else? That I want to make sure we don't have a whole bunch of questions hanging out there, Jack, that you think might be important because I didn't see them all because of my little blurb of disappearing. <laughs> um, we we do have a, a few questions. I don't want to keep you sitting here trying to answer questions. Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll pull these questions together and send them to you in a uh, in an email, and then um, 
whenever you get a chance, go ahead and reply back to them, and then I'll make sure that uh, the community gets these uh, gets the answers to these questions. Okay, and then Jack, I'll get you a couple of samples of a chronological versus a um, skills resume. Perfect. And that would be great. A, maybe even a hybrid, because that one we were looking at is sort of in that situation where it, it might be best for it to be a hybrid. So I'll get you examples of those. Awesome. All righty. So I want to thank everyone for hanging out with us today, and especially a huge thanks to Kathy Wilkins. Um, Kathy, you've given us a ton of great information. Uh, I expect to hear a, a lot of feedback from the community. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, everybody. All right, everyone. We'll see you in the community. Bye now.